Thanks very much, Alicia and Raglan, for having me and everyone for coming. So um, Alicia's given quite a good introduction there. So I'm mostly going to be talking about the Lefroy drainage system, but you can extrapolate the learnings from the Lefroy to other regolith hosted deposits across the Yale Garn. Um, a lot of people in this room do know me, but for those of you that don't, who am I aside from that Paleo Channel obsessed LinkedIn poster? Because I'm sure that's where many of you do know me from. I started my career as a biostratigrapher. I am a marine micropaleontologist. I am an expert in foraminifera and North Sea oil and gas. Start of 2012, I moved to Australia and there really isn't much scope for a foraminifera biostratigrapher in Australia. So I ended up in exploration. And I've worked on various commodities, but the most common were iron ore, gold and lithium. And then, as Alicia said, I've got three kids. I went on a very long maternity leave. I didn't really want to know what I wanted to do while I was on maternity leave. I know, knew that I had done my penance in industry and I didn't want to go back to that. So I ended up doing a passion PhD. Um, as well as doing that, I, as Alicia said, I also have my own um, education and regolith consultancy and I work with various organizations and schools throughout the whole state um, in earth science education. So we'll do a quick location overview, but I'm sure everyone here knows just how far away from Perth we are. But for those of you that don't, we're 650 kilometers east and all of my research is centered around that box there. That whole catchment is the Lefroy drainage system. It comprises of Lake Lefroy, Lake Randall, Angelfish Lake, Dog Lake, and these other salt pans that for the purposes of my research, I've named Fitzgerald Lagoon and Medunia Breakaways. Um, but there's not a lot of outcrop. This is mostly subsurface. I'd say about 95% of what I do is subsurface. And it's all thanks to Goldfields Australia and St. Ives Goldmine that I have access to this core. Um, and there's four main drilling areas that I'm going to be talking about. There's Neptune, Invincible, Lake Randall and Sal. But I may call that the JV or Lex. Um, so they're the four main areas where I've got my drill core from. Fun fact, Japan actually white balance their satellites against Lake Lefroy because it is so bright against the surrounding desert. Um, in case anyone doesn't know what these paleo channels are or what these drainages are, I'll give a quick overview. If you squint and get your eye in on this satellite image, you'll see there are chains of salt lakes all heading off towards the Officer Basin and the onshore Euclid Basin. From north to south, they're the Carey, Rayside, Rebecca, Rowe, Lefroy, and Cowan. I'm not 100% convinced that the Cowan was a complete separate drainage system at the time that these rocks were deposited. I think it probably was a tributary trunk of the Lefroy, but there's some evidence for it being a separate system and for it being joined. Um, so we've known that these salt lakes are the surface expression of buried drainages since about 1897. Um, but we're concentrating just on this one, the Lefroy drainage. But how old are these systems? Well, the short answer is no one knows. Uh, the longer answer is there was probably some sort of proto-fluvial river system that was exploiting jointing in the Archean bedrock pre-Permian glaciation. Then we've had a Permian glaciation that has occurred and it has peneplanated the entire Yilgarn Craton. That's why we don't have any other rocks here. Um, but there are some Permian rocks influenced by our ice that are infilling these drainages. And it's normally called the Patterson Formation. It does outcrop way more extensively further north. And there are quite some thick deposits of it that you see in uh, drill core, sort of around Agnew. That core is actually from Agnew, and it's quite an obvious tillite. But in the Lefroy drainage system, we have this stuff. It's three units, and it looks like a fluvial sandstone until you start to look at the polymictic clasts. 
This stuff isn't directly deposited by ice, but the class in there are influenced by ice. I've got some over here that everyone can have a look at afterwards, or you probably all had a look at. They have some fantastic, obvious influenced by ice shapes. They're flat on the bottom. They're rounding into a nose or a point. They have striations, they have facets. So we know that at some point in their history, they were influenced by ice. But not only that, we have some boulders in the lag on the surface, there's one there, and there are plenty of others of half the size of me that are garnet bearing leucogranites. The only place that these probably could have come from is the AFO, the Albany Fraser origin. So we know that they have come from a very, very distal source. And as I say, these boulders are huge, so probably not sitting in a river system, especially when the rest of this is fairly mature, probably brought there by ice. Um, but we do have evidence for glacial material sitting directly in paleo channels further north. And these are Agnew, Lancefield West and Sand King, or Ancondili as well. These are the outcrop samples down here. Um, so there's no direct dating evidence, there's no bedrock striations, there's no polished surfaces, but I believe it would have looked something like this in the lower reaches of the Lefroy drainage at some point in the Permian. Um, that there, the open ocean, probably would have been the officer basin. And we do have evidence for marine glacial sedimentation in the officer basin and for ice rafted debris that is flowing into the officer basin. Um, I believe that the stuff that's been deposited in the Lafroy probably would have been somewhere like this. It's a fluvial glacial outwash material that is being deposited in front of a retreating glacier. Um, so, yeah, that's Kenai Fords National Park in Alaska. And I reckon if you'd looked out of the window in the Permian during the Sakmarian glaciation, that's what it would have looked like. So summing up those influences on incision, we've got glacial bedrock scouring, creating these big valleys. And then we've got fluvio glacial outwash. And then in the Mesozoic, it's a bit weird because we don't know what's happening. There's no real sedimentation during the Mesozoic. There has been some found in the craters up in Orobanda, near Orobanda, but as far as I know, that hasn't been published. That's just all personal communication with the guys that are working on it. Um, and there is a bit of Mesozoic outcropping right on the southwest corner of the Yilgarn. So there's probably some sort of erosional regime. But Middle Eocene, we suddenly switch to a depositional regime. What caused the switch? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. But we've got up to 120 meters of Eocene sediments preserved in these channels. And then just like a switch at the end of the Eocene and the start of the Oligocene, we have that onset of aridity. That's related to Australia and Antarctica completely separating. Antarctic circumpolar current kicked in. That led to permanent ice sheet growth on Antarctica and it led to aridity on the Australian continent. Uh, I'll do a quick overview of the stratigraphy before I go into some more detail. But we've got this middle and late Eocene sequence of basal gravels, some fluvial uh, material, marginal marine, and then some fully marine on the top. This is the unit that everyone is really, really interested in. It's got the gold in it. It's called the North Royal Formation. And if you've been logging this on your mine site, I can almost guarantee you've been calling it Padinga Formation, Lower Werrellup Formation, or Hampton Sandstone. In 2003, all of that naming and all of that stratigraphy was completely overturned to correlate with these channels that go all the way to the other side of the Eucla Basin, to the other side of the Nullarbor. So it's the North Royal Formation. It is gold bearing. There is super gene gold in these channels, but I, I'm not talking about, when I talk about the gold, I'm not talking about the super gene gold, I'm talking about the alluvial place of deposits that are primary with no evidence of super gene alteration. Um, it's a gravel and it finds up in stacked channels and there are up to four stacked channels. Gravel, very coarse, coarse, medium, and so on. This is representing high energy bed loads and gravel bars that are stacking and migrating and moving in a very high energy anastomosing river system. And we've dated this, there are some chunks of lignite in it, and it's pretty unremarkable. It's lower middle Nophophagidites asperus zone, it's between 40 and 38 million years old. But we found some new members as part of this research and the drilling that St. Ives did. 
And this is from the JV from the Sal area. And it's the equivalent of that basal gravel, but it's polymictic and it's really, really immature. It also appears as stacked channels. We've dated it, it's exactly the same age. There are some minor traces of gold in this stuff too. But why does it look so different? Honestly, we don't know. We've got some ideas that maybe there's some near tectonics, maybe it's a different catchment that's not always as active, maybe it's higher up in the topography. Uh, we're going to hopefully chuck a seismic line along there and see what's going on, but that will be answered as part of ongoing research. And then probably the thickest unit that we have in the Lefroy Paleo channels is the Werrellup formation. The palynology on it is, you know, really unremarkable. It's just no Phagodites aspirus zone, um, so it's Middle Eocene in age, but it has some really, really cool features and some really, really cool fossils loads and loads and loads of fossil wood like you could be picking it out of the core trays for days and never get to the end of it and over on the table i do have an amazing piece of marcasite replaced fossil wood there's also some fossil leaves in here as well there's one there these are broad and flat so lots of water lots of water very very warm rainforest taxa and if you really get your eye in on that core you'll see lines fine black lines, they're all further leaves. I actually had a, a big sort of two meter section of core and I broke it off at every single one of those laminations and every single lamination had fossil leaves in it, which was really, really cool for me anyway. Um, it's, it's formed in a variety of low energy fluvial settings. You know, there's some rivers that are meandering around, there's some overbank flooding deposits, there's some lacustrine deposits. Um, there's sort of varved sediments as well. But the really, really cool thing about this is this fossil. I know there's about 20 of them and they're all at GSWA in Perth. And if you know what it is, please let us know. We know that it's a fossil fruit. We know that it came from a proteaceo tree, but we don't know what one. It's the first time they have ever been found in WA. Miocene ones have been found elsewhere in Australia. And I was, you know, reading through some papers, trying to figure out what they were. And I came across that exact image in a paper, went to the bottom of the plate to see what they'd called it. And it just said, unknown fossil fruit reproductive structure. <laughs> Haven't found out what that is, have I? Um, but one of these drill holes is really interesting. 20274, there's some evidence of marine influence, potential reworking. There's some spicules in there, some sponge spicules. They're sort of the broken down inner bits of siliceous sponges. And there's also a broken and fragmented dinoflagellate in there. But whether or not that is primary and there is some marine influence or whether it's just been reworked and it's come down on the RC from the bottom or not, we don't know yet. I found this on the very first time I ever went in an open pit and it made me really, really excited. If you get your eye in on this, you'll see this is Neptune, by the way. There's vertical columns of lignite and they're truncated by a really thick clay unit. That's a forest and it has been drowned and it has been preserved. So they're all trees standing up quite proud and quite happy. And then something has come along, big flooding event, and it has drowned those out. And I'm willing to bet that that sort of environment is evident in a lot of these paleo channel gold pits, but no one's bothered looking for it and, and no one's reported on it yet. So if you do have anything like this in your pits, please let me know. I will happily come along and log it and photograph it for research purposes. And then we also have this in the Werrellup formation, although I'm going to go and do some more work at GSWA next week on Monday, and I may actually move this to a, another, this particular one to another formation, to the Palinup formation. But for now, we're going to call it Upper Werrellup, and we're going to suggest that it's a progradational delta fasces that is sitting on top of all of this swampy stuff and underneath the fully marine stuff. Uh, it's a high energy environment. They are intraformational rip up clasts. Um, there's some other cross bedding in there as well. Unfortunately, mine sites don't like to run tools down the hole when it's just in paleo channel. So we have no structural data on this. So we don't know where any of it has come from. Um, there's no marginal marine fossils in there, which is why it may not be palinop formation, but it's pretty cool and it sits on top of all of that swampy stuff. 
And this is what all three of these units look like in one core. There's swampy, lignitic, low energy stuff. Intraformational rip up class in there and sort of cross bedded progradational sandstone in there. And then we found another new member. This is also from that JV drilling area from the Lex uh, Sal area. We call it the Randall Spiculite, and it's probably the spatial equivalent of the Upper Werrellup Formation. This stuff is really, really weird. There's 80 meters of marine influence lignite, and it's full of sponge spicules. Why it exists, we don't know, uh, but it's cool anyway. It's probably some sort of intertidal environment, maybe a protected tidal embayment. I think probably something like the Fitzgerald River Inlet. And when there has been, you know, high seas and floods, that's washed stuff in and this is what's happened. Don't really know where it fits and why it fits in the stratigraphy, except it's there and it's probably a spatial equivalent of the Werrellup. However, if you get your eye in on this, you'll see lots and lots of sort of irregular bands. They're all marcosite bands. We were racking our brains trying to figure out why this particular unit was banded with marcosite replacement the whole way through the like 80 meters of it. I think it's probably dinoflagellate blooms and it's showing seasonal variations in those blooms. But it's really difficult to try and prove this. Normally, you'd just fin section it. Fortunately, if you've worked with this material, you know that it's not consolidated, it's not lithified. You sneeze and the whole thing falls apart. So we're, we're going to get creative. We're going to use some carbon wax to stabilize it, some paraloid to um, you know, firm it up and mean, so we can thin section it. And then it's all going to go down to Bob in Esperance and he's going to thin section it for me. And then we can look down. So we'll thin section it this way and we'll be able to look at those bands and we'll be able to see if there are variations in the volume of um, dinoflagellates in there to see if they are dinoflagellate blooms. And this has been seen in more modern sediments in like the um, Gulf of Mexico where they've had tornado uh, hurricanes come through and things like that. So it's not out of the question to think that's what it could be recording. And then we found another new formation. Um, this formation holds quite a special place in my heart because this was what got me onto this passion PhD in the first place. And I've actually got the big hand sample there. Many of you will know David Nixon, who used to work at St. Ives Goldmine. And he knew I was a paleontologist and he knew I was looking to come off of maternity leave. And he went, hey, Leah, you're a paleontologist. Do you want to come and have a look at this rock I found? It's got shells in it. And I went, what do you mean you found a rock with shells in it? Isn't it all archaic and gold? And he went, yeah, well, we found a rock with shells in it. And then we found a bit more of it. And then we found a little bit more of it. Um, this is the Palinup formation. It's not new to science. This is known. It's very, very extensive further south, all the way around sort of the Bremer subbasin, around to Albany, around to Wapple, further onshore. But it is new to the Lafroy drainage system. It's a marine gravel. And it's very, very high energy. These forms of pectin in there, the morphology lets us know it's sitting in some really turbulent waters. The microfossils in here let us know that it's a shallow, high energy environment. But there's also a lot of polished ferruginous gravel in here, and it's a very, very mixed maturity sediment. I think what's probably happened is there's a topographic high somewhere where this has been. It's only been found at Invincible and at Neptune. And interestingly enough, underneath it, there's a fairly stripped profile. We don't get a very thick saprolite development above the bedrock. It's very, very thin, whereas in other places, you might see up to 20 meters of it below the paleo channels. Um, but here you don't see that. So probably some sort of paleotopographic height. And what's happened is there has been a local sea level drop. And this has been subaerially exposed. It has become ferruginized. And then when the Tekecha transgression proper has come through and deposited the next unit, it's eroded everything else out in the channels. Because this is higher up, it's been protected. And when things have calmed down and they have deposited the slightly lower energy sediments above it, this has been quite well protected. That's what I think is happening. And um, we've got some evidence for drying events elsewhere in core as well. We've got some very, very thin layers of red sands and red clays that typically represent drying events. So there's just some more um, images of it there. This is the one that, that got me onto this. Um, oh, I've actually got that one over there if anyone wants to have a look at it. 
and uh, my husband sent me that quite excitedly when they found it when they were logging some core from Invincible. And no one has ever used an SEM on this stuff before to look at microfossils, but these are the microfossils from that Palinop formation that are from the SEM. Um, some gastropods, it's an echinoid spine, that's a cross section for an echinoid spine, there's some alphidium. Oh, we're debating what this one might be. And despite the fact that they are horrendously preserved because of the hypersaline waters running through these channels, I think they're quite beautiful. And then we get on to the bane of my existence, the Princess Royal Spongelite. I am haunted by this unit. I am haunted by sponge spicule splinters in my fingers every single time I log it. I cannot get away from sponges. Even when I go to Esperance, I find sponges washed up on the, the beach. Um, but there's three main units of the Princess Royal Spongelite that we've found in the Lafroy drainage system. We've found a channel sandstone, a shore face fasces, or beach fasces, and also an inner embayment shallow marine. Um, that is just some trough cross bedding in the Binaringi outcrop. But what is quite interesting about this stuff is we've got up to sort of 25, 26 meters of it, and it's all formed in shallow, warm water. Modern spiculite mats only form where it is very, very cold, very, very deep, and very, very dark. And we also only get maybe five or 10 centimeters of it. We've got up to 26 meters of this stuff. And we know that it's being formed in a warm environment because of there's a diatom that is associated with this arachnodiscus in Berghai, and it is only associated with warm seagrass meadows. And the mineral odonite has also been found uh, in this unit. And that only forms where sea surface temperatures go above 22 degrees Celsius. So channel sands. Um, they're everywhere. They are the most common unit. They, we hit them in every single drill hole. If you see outcrop of this stuff, it is 99% of the time going to be this. The spicule content in it is varying between 20 and 90%, but the spicules themselves are really, really varied and they massively change up section and they're probably representing environmental change up section. I'm not a specialist in sponge spicules, but I'm really lucky to have a couple of colleagues in Poland that are, and they're currently looking at that for me and describing the changes up section. Um, it's probably being deposited proximal to a marine setting, something like a tidal inlet. It's very, very close to an open ocean to get packages of marine stuff that thick, basically. And if you squint and get your eye in on that picture, See some trough cross bedding. This is the Neptune open pit, and there is trough cross bedding in the wall. And then if you look at this line here, and I'll just put the green line on it, that's a silk creek. And I've had a chat to various people that have been drilling through this, and they can't decide between themselves whether it's worth to try and hammer through the silk creek or try and get through the running sands. Um, but it was formed when this, we think, when the sea level locally would have dropped. Because these sponges are all made of silica and the rest of what's in there is quartz, when it dries out and then when you get meteoric diagenesis, you're basically getting a silk rate. So that's representing a localized drying event at some point during the Eocene before more Princess Royal Spongelite was deposited on top of it. And then we have a shore face or a beach fasces. Um, I'm sure everyone here has been to Esperance or has been to Albany and they've stood on the shore and they've seen all that beautiful, beautiful white sand that squeaks if you do this. Uh, you wouldn't want to do it then because that's like crushed glass. Um, but the quartz in it is the same. It's very, very spherical and uh, squeaky. Um, but you'd also see those winnows of heavy black minerals if you go to the beach today. That's what that is. It's just winnowing of heavy minerals and it's in core and in outcrop. So it's a shore face fasces. And then we found another new member. Um, I've said that it's under the Princess Royal Spongelite in here, but it probably does deserve its own member status because of how special this is. This is completely novel to the onshore yield gum. It's a shallow marine reef. In outcrop, this is about 200 meters long and about three meters high. And it is full of sponge body fossils. And I've got a bunch of them here that people can look at. 
Um, and all of the fossils in this are very well potentially brand new to science. And a bunch of them are currently over in Poland with my colleagues and they're describing them. Um, there's there's a you know, variation of lithosid, non-lithosid demosponges in there, but they're all silicious. And we know that there's been normal marine salinities, despite the amount of sponges there are, that diversity tells us that this isn't a stressed community. This is actually quite a happy little marine community. And I swear I'm not telling lies. If you look at that, that's a gastropod. If you look, you can see the world's there. There is a gastropod in there. So there are some very rare calcareous macrofossils. And there are some diatoms as well. And Alicia and I actually found some of these last week in my thin section. It's one just there. That's an arachnodiscus. Uh, so there's sort of various um, miscellaneous fasces, uh, miscellaneous images that I'm not quite sure where to put, but I thought I'd chuck them in anyway. Um, we've got some Ophiomorpha burrows, and they're letting us know that it's a really high energy environment. Why something would want to live in what is essentially crushed glass, I don't know, but they're there and it did. Um, there's lots of cross bedding, and then there's this sort of marine gravel as well. And if you want a modern analogy, it's that. If you go into, I know I use Esperance a lot, but it's the closest beach to us. Go and stand down on the beach at Esperance and look out and you see heaps and heaps of islands, all granitic. I hope they're all granitic now I said that. And that's what it would have looked like. If you'd stood on Mount Burgess, Mount Charlotte, Red Hill at any point during the late Eocene, it would have looked like that. All of those topo highs would have been the islands and there would have been a nice warm shallow sea below you. Would have been nice on a day like today, but I'm again, I'm not sure you'd want to swim in it because it's basically like walking through crushed glass. And then these are the boring things. We colloquially call them lake sediments, but they're those um, lacustrine and evaporitic sediments that sit above the channels. They're not exclusive to the channels, though. These also occur off the lakes as well. Um, they're probably representing the onset of aridity. And today, there is still flow in these drainages, but it's subsurface. They are, most of them have hypersaline aquifers through them. I'm willing to bet many of the bore fields at mine sites you work on are pumping water out of these hypersaline aquifers. And if you've ever been on a drill rig, when it hits one, like a geyser going up. Um, there's no permanent standing water at the surface. If there is any water, it's from when we have rain events and from when we have storms except Lake Lefroy has some water on it that kind of just gets blown about with the wind. Um, yeah. So sort of summarizing that, we've got that gravel at the bottom that's got the gold in it, quite a high energy environment. Then we've got a nice lazy fluvial environment, then some marginal marine, and then some marine on the top, and then it gets boring with those evaporitic things. Then I mentioned that I wasn't sure if the Cowan system should be its own separate system. I have in the past presented this as a brand new unit to the Lefroy drainage system. I currently don't think that was correct and would like to retract that. I have a legacy sample from GSWA and it states that it is from a borehole on Lake Lefroy where the revenge waste dump is today says that it's Norseman limestone. It's the first occurrence of Norseman limestone that's been found on Lake Lefroy. I got really excited by this. Limestone, Lake Lefroy, yes please. I think it was probably mislabeled and it has come from Lake Cowan where this stuff is really, really extensive. Um, but I can guarantee you that is the first coccolithophore anyone has ever seen from the Yilgarn Craton. And it was hanging out on a fragment of Bryozoan. We happened to see it when we were SEMing other fossils and got really excited because it's the first time any of us have accidentally found nanofossil. Um, so I think the legacy sample is mislabeled. But if it isn't mislabeled, and if it did come from underneath Lake Lefroy, it proves that the Cowan and the Lefroy systems were one system because that sea level rise during the Tortoise transgression was not great enough for the Lefroy drainage system to have been flooded from the Eucla. It would have had to have flooded from the south and from the Bremer Basin coming through the Cowan system. Would have had to. This, the sea level rise wasn't high enough. Um, so it's it's probably mislabeled, but it's cool anyway. And while we had it there and we had it under the SCM, we took some pictures. 
and that's my favorite little for despite how poorly preserved it is that's a cross section for a sherbonina atkinsoni um these are all foraminifera and there's a fragment of bryzoan there and if anyone knows what that weird little donut thing is that is inside the bryzoan please let me know because my supervisor and i didn't have a clue but we thought it was really cool so we took a picture of it so the stratigraphy here is really way more complex locally and across the whole drainage system than anyone has realized before excuse me there's a very very complex interfingering of all of these terrestrial marginal marine and marine environments and they're all being sort of deposited interfingering at the same time and it's a mess um, the onshore Euclid marine environments were probably way more far reaching than we previously thought only because of that um, Randall's reef but we never ever thought that the sea level would ever come that far inland before and it has um, and that Fitzgerald member equivalent is also present but what I'm sure many of you are here for tonight is the provenance of the gold um, and I am just talking about the primary gold with no supergene alteration this stuff is all from Neptune, Neptune open pit. Very first day that I ever went into an open pit, I sat down on a bank of rubble and I started sketching out that drowned forest environment in the pit wall. And then I went, oh my God, my foot was on that. I'd never seen that much gold before in my life and I was really excited, but they didn't let me keep it. Um, so CSIRO have done some fingerprinting on the gold grains from Neptune, trying to figure out where they have come from. They got their paleo current direction wrong. They presumed that everything was flowing south. So they discounted comparing it to hard rock deposits south of Neptune. Um, so it's like Hamlet and all of those deposits. And they only looked at the ones um, above it. They decided that based on the trace elements that they saw in there, they had to come from the underlying greenstone belt. And why would you bother looking further than that when you've got a massive greenstone belt underneath you and it is, has all of these massive ore bodies in it? Why would you bother looking further? You know where it's come from. But then in-house Goldfields looked at some trace elements in these gold grains and also from the Athena and Mars paleo channels too. And while most of it, they concluded, probably did come from the underlying greenstone belt, there's a small population that didn't. It, the trace elements were way out there for anything known from the Cambauda camp. So where did it come from? And this is where I split the room in two. And half of you are going to call the University of Plymouth and demand I give my geology degree back. And the other half of you are going to go, you know what, that makes sense. Um, I think it's come from glaciers. I think that ice has moved it. Just that small population. What else could cause such a uniform distribution of basal place of gold with all of these weird geochemical signatures across the entirety of the Yilgarn? Because these gold deposits aren't you know, unique. They aren't exclusive to the Lafroy drainage. Every single one of these drainage systems has basal place of gold in it. They've been e exploited for a hundred years. Um, what can move that much material with gold in it? Well, ice can. I can't think of anything else that could universally do that. And then once those rocks have been dumped, they've then been sorted and winnowed through millions of years of fluvial processes. And we end up with that small gold population and this isn't a completely out there idea because there is glacial place of gold being mined elsewhere in the world canada the southeast andes and even otago in new zealand but why should you guys care about any of this to do with paleo channels and the regolith well if you're using a holistic mineral systems approach you need to understand the regolith because if you don't you're not doing your ore bodies a service and exploration undercover is what we're all doing we've found everything outcropping at the surface pretty much we're only going to find stuff undercover and most of the continent is under some pretty deep cover and if you don't understand the regolith and you don't understand the cover and you don't understand the channels you're not going to really be able to understand your ore bodies below and when mistakes are made, time and money is wasted. If you 
lump all of the regolith into one thing, you're going to make mistakes. The regolith isn't homogenous. We have channels, we have saprolite, we have also, and it, you know, it varies wherever you are. And you're also potentially going to miss really, really easily exploitable basal placer gold that you can rip out with an open pit, shallow open pit, raise some capital, go and look at those deeper deposits. Um, and I'll just give you some examples of what I've been told in the last five or six years of me doing this to convince you that you really do need to understand the regolith and especially these channels more. Um, but after about a month of me starting this project, I started logging the basal quartz. I was told by the exploration geo that was supervising me that day, don't bother logging that. That's a quartz vein. We don't care about that stuff. This was the Neptune deposit basal rock. CSIRO got the current direction wrong. And if they can get it wrong, anyone can get it wrong. Um, people have mistaken Permian tillite boulders in channels further north as bedrock. And I know that when they were drilling out that JV in the south area, they intercepted that um, polymictic conglomerate and they stopped drilling because they thought it was bedrock and it wasn't bedrock. Um, some very, very funny mistakes made with logging. I've, uh, people have known that there's paleo channel present and they've decided that a felsic intrusive was limestone. And on the other side of that, one of my colleagues that was logging down in Higginsville knew a geologist that logged the limestone as a felsic intrusive. And they had put down the echinoid plates, the fossilized echinoid plates that are preserved in there, that they were phenocrysts. It happens because if, if you don't understand it, you're making it match to what you know and what you want it to be. Um, most people here know if you've got a lag, you want to look up. You want to see where it's come from. But is anyone taking into consideration the paleotopography and the paleogeomorphology? I know that people have skipped over the entire regolith when they have been assaying and they've just sent a basement intercept. I know people have made mistakes with their basement intercepts and they think that they are sending the basement to the lab and they're not. They're 10 meters below it or 10 meters above it. And a lot of people, a lot of junior companies can only afford to send one sample and then they get rid of their material. Keep your regolith material. It doesn't take up much room and it's, um, it's pretty important. But where do we want to go next with this? What, what can this tell us? Like there's a, a whole range of regolith resources. Clay-hosted rare earth elements are massive at the moment. Mount Weld that is sitting up there on that green triangle. They predict that four vertical kilometers of the Mount Weld carbonatite has been eroded away. And I just want everyone to look at how close that is to Lake Cary and the Cary drainage system. We've got gold, uranium, the Mulga Rock uranium deposit is hosted in the lignite. Fresh water, we need water to survive. The salt water for the bore fields, for the drilling operations, salt, alunite, you know, laterite for the building industry. Where, what do we want to do? If I was a betting woman and I was exploring, that's where I'd go. All of these drainages are heading off into the officer basin, but the problem is the cover in the officer basin is deep. There are kilometers of it. And what do you need to do that? You need a thorough understanding of the regolith and where the upstream processes and where the upstream sediments have come from. So if I had loads and loads of money, that's where I'd start buying tenements. Um, there's a bunch of people that I really do need to thank for this research. Um, Espen, Paul and Greg, who are all my supervisors, obviously Goldfields Australia, because without them, I wouldn't have any material at all. Um, Sarah Martin, Alicia and Hugh Smithies at GSWA, who have all helped me with various questions and, and things. Oleg, Ben, Leo and Jay, who all are or were working for Goldfields because they have all been my fieldies and come out into the field with me and kept me safe because I am a little bit silly when I see exciting rocks. Um, Andres and Magdalena, who are my Polish colleagues that are looking at all of these sponges. Andrew Rhodesfields at the Queensland Museum and Ray Carpenter at the University of Adelaide. They're paleobotanists and they've been amazing. Um, Adam at MG Paleo is my palynologist because I don't do any of the palynology myself. Um, and he has been a sounding board for me and we've chatted about a lot of these environments. And all of the Argonauts, I'm part of the Australian Regolith Geoscientists Alliance. 
um, but especially Anna Petz, who is our current chair. John Clark, who used to work for WMC, and he's worked at um, St. Ives and down at Higginsville. Nadir and Nacho, too. But most importantly, I need to thank my kids because this takes up a lot of my time and I do have to fly all over the country. I'm based at James Cook University and I often have to go to Perth for work and they're also really good fieldies. I've got some great videos of my son who was then sort of 18 months old whacking out crops for me and my husband who sort of sat in the back there that has basically funded this and put up with me talking about this drainage system for the last six years with very little complaint. So thank you very much, and any questions? <laughs>